What would have happened if David had looked away on that rooftop? What if he had just in that moment decided, nope, turned away and didn't end up in this cascading sort of compounding crazy scenario? So I think a principle there is we need to learn how to win the small battles against these things because if you win the small battles, you don't have to fight the much bigger ones that you're much more likely to lose. Well, we are really excited to have Peter coming and continuing our David series. So why don't we welcome him up? Lord Jesus, I thank you for Peter. Lord Jesus, I thank you for his passion for the scriptures. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all of the work that I know he's put into this week to bring this portion of scripture to life. I pray that you give him clarity of thought, clarity of mind, Lord Jesus, as he tackles this difficult subject. I pray, God, that you would come and your presence would be with us. Would you lead us into all truth as you promised? Amen. Thanks, Adam. Nice of him to pray for me. Um, He texted when I was on paternity leave and said, could you speak on the 4th of Feb? And I said, isn't that the flawed session? And he said, yeah, you'll be great at it. (laughs) So thanks for the prayer. (laughs) How are we doing? All right. Before I start, I just want to say a really heartfelt thank you on behalf of Andrea and I um, as we've welcomed Isla into our family over the past four weeks and two days. Hello, Jolie. Yes, very into You've got a new friend. You're excited. Um, but we, we haven't cooked a single meal in those four weeks. We've had um, people from this church just uh, giving us food, turning up with hot food, um, trying to steal a cuddle as well at the same time. Um, but we just feel really loved and really looked after. Um, and it's a real joy to bring a child into not just our family, but into this church family. Um, and if I get distracted, it's because I'm still awed by her presence. Um, she's, she's also wearing lots of outfits that our five-year-old you know, Willow wore when she was a baby, so it's also quite nostalgic as a dad. I'm like, oh my goodness, my little girl. Another one. So there we go. On a related note also, this is probably the most sleep-deprived sermon you'll ever hear. So <laughs> if I start talking about King Donald and the Queen of Sheba, um, you'll know I'm talking about David and Bathsheba. Um, and not making any political inferences either. So, uh, yes, I think we've got it up here. Yes, so week one, we, we looked at David the Forgotten. Last week, Adam looked at David the Faithful. And so today we're going to look at David the Flawed. So just by way of sort of jogging your memory, I want you to take your hand. Don't put it right on the floor, but put it down sort of low, right? Okay, this is David, Jesse's son, the youngest of eight, shepherd boy. And then we're going to start to rise our hand here. He defeats Goliath. He's a man full of faith. He's writing the Psalms. He goes in the wilderness. He's faithful to God. I mean, it's just this meteoric rise to just unbelievable blessing and humility and then stop right there and then go like this. And uh, that's what we're going to look at today. Um, Second Samuel chapters 11 and 12 are quite a turning point in David's life. Um, And so we've got quite a lot I want to cover today. But uh, let us begin. We're going to read two different passages, but we're going to look at them sort of um, separately. So the first one is um, 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 17. I'm going to read this slowly. Um, This is one of the most famous stories in the world, not just in the Bible. It's a very powerful story. And so if you want to follow along on the screen, do that. If you want to pull up your own Bible, do that. We're going to look at some of the stuff in more detail after we read it. And also, if you just want to close your eyes and really absorb yourself in the story, <clears throat> do that as well, because that's what I think primarily it's designed to do. So let's just take 10 seconds to just prepare ourselves to listen to this. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. 
send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. This is a pretty sobering story, isn't it? Do you feel the, the weight of this, of the, the, the cascading effect of David's decisions? And we're not prepared for it when we come to this chapter. If you're just reading through the book of 2 Samuel, as I said, it was a joke, right? But it's true. It's, it's quite a jarring moment because David so far is portrayed as a loyal friend, a courageous leader, a wise king, as a God-fearing individual, someone full of humility, someone who trusted God, someone who had this life of belief that led to this outer action of justice and love towards others. David is really the bright hope of leadership that Israel has so badly needed. And then what begins as a lustful glance, as a sort of whim, quickly develops into this enormous, out of control sex and murder crime, complete with lying and coveting and ignoring God. About half the Ten Commandments all in one fell swoop. And if it's not enough just to listen to the story in English as we have just done, I wanna just walk through the text again and point out a couple of things that might not be immediately obvious when you first read it that actually compound the effect even further of how serious an offense this was, some detail in the text. Notice in verse one, in the Hebrew, there's a very clear juxtaposition between the army's activity and David's inactivity. It doesn't explain why David remained behind, but in springtime when this was, that's you know, when they would have gone to war once the winter had finished. And so we're, we're left wondering, like, why is David staying behind this time? In verse three, when he sends someone to find out about who the woman is, it describes her as Bathsheba, um, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah. Now, why is that important? Well, often um, women in the Hebrew Bible wouldn't have been introduced in such a manner. This is quite unusual. And it's like the messenger is almost trying to warn David or, you know, almost plead with him not to do what he thinks he might do because um, Eliam and Uriah are men known to David. And in fact, Uriah was one of his mighty men. Anyone heard of David's mighty men? And so Uriah, in some sense, is someone who David owes a lot to because the mighty men, of course, saved David's life. And so it's almost like this messenger is humanizing Bathsheba, reminding David, this is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's wife. Don't do this. And um, <clears throat> this one, I apologize. Once you learn this, it sort of ruins the passage, right? There is, there is a particular verb that happens so many times that once you see it, you start to get almost distracted by it. Does anybody notice what the verb was? Send. Yes, well done. So there are 11 or 12 times in this passage we see the word send, and it's really interesting. There's loads of sort of extra stuff you can do on this if you're, if you're a Bible nerd like me, go and read about the use of the verb send in 2 Samuel 11. 
But it's almost, it's, it's communicating this idea that David is kind of detached because he's the king, he's in a position of power. And so we read really quickly, and if you go through it again, you, you will notice this, but David, um, he sends for her, um, he sends Joab, he sends the army. Um, it's, it's just this rush of like, he sends, he sends, he sends. He's someone who's just getting others to do his bidding. He's someone who's used to being listened to. And so I think there's an extra warning built in here for people who are in positions of power, bosses, people who manage others. There's an extra warning here. There's, it's almost this sense that David was kind of removed from the personal kind of intimacy of some of his own decisions. And so this recurring use of the word send, one scholar describes it as the theme word of this passage. And then notice the particular instance when, when David sleeps with Bathsheba. It's kind of, there's no conversation, there's no intimacy, there's no deeper meaning here. There's, again, another rush of verbs. He sent, he took, he lay, she returned, she conceived. And in the Hebrew, it's even more compact. We have lots more words than the Hebrew language does. And so it's this very kind of terse, short, almost dispassionate relaying of events. It's kind of removing any sense of affection or love. It was this disposable exchange to David. Another interesting detail is when David is talking to Uriah, he inquires as to the well-being of Joab and of the army and of the war. Like, how is it going with Joab? How is it going? With, and there's this, that's the word shalom, right? And the word shalom is about flourishing, wellness, and, you know, wholeness, right? And so as David is actively deceiving others and trying to get himself out of a mess. He has this front of shalom. He's inquiring, how are things going, you know? Another little interesting detail in the text is David gets led further and further into the consequences of his decisions. Uriah is described as a Hittite many times throughout the passage, almost too many times to be necessary, like just tell us once. But I think, again, it's trying to remind us of something. A Hittite is someone, he wouldn't have been a child of the Torah. You know, he's, he's not someone who grew up knowing Yahweh as David had done. He would have been a convert to Judaism. And so the great irony built into this story is that this convert of foreign ancestry is actually more righteous than the anointed king of Israel. Multiple times Uriah shows himself to be a man of integrity. He won't even go home to his own house, presumably just around the corner when he's come home from a military campaign. Such is his integrity. And even when David gets him drunk, Uriah is still showing himself to be more righteous than David. Again, just an incredible amount of irony built in there that we, we could miss. And finally, we get to that utterly shocking detail of David giving Uriah his own death warrant to carry back to the front. I mean, that is like crazy, <laughs> crazy level of twisted, isn't it? So all in all, this is a very, very powerful text. And it's supposed to be, there's a reason this story has stuck in the imagination, not just of Christians for so many years at this point. And I think there's a few principles that we can pull out of this story. I'm wary often of just kind of reading a story like that and just trying to go, therefore, X, Y, Z. I don't think it's as simple as that. But I do think there's a couple of observations that we can make that are quite helpful. The first thing is this. We are all susceptible to sin. If King David did this, then we are all capable of it as well. You're not ontologically different than King David. And so the seeds of these kind of deeds, they lie in each and every one of our hearts. And when we read a story like this, I want to say particularly in our modern climate of cancelling people, we're very quick to turn David into the bad guy here and just scrub out everything he's done. But let's not forget, this is the man after God's own heart, right? David is portrayed as a good man. I don't think David was an evil man any more than you and I are, right? He, he, he's, he's messed up big time this time. But we can't just suddenly pretend he's all bad, even after his death if, in 1 Kings 15, 5. Because David, what was did in the, right in the eyes of the Lord, this is after he's died, and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You know, and so this is a stain that will stay with him for the rest of his life. But we have to remember, like, this is something that we are all capable of. And so the story of David here should serve as a mirror for us to look into. You know, the David that wrote the Psalms, who trusted God against Goliath, what a terrifying encounter that must have been. The David that wrote, I delight to do your will, O God, your law is written on my heart from Psalm 40 to pick one of hundreds of possible lines that we, we believe David wrote in the Psalms. 
And even members of God's family are vulnerable to these kind of deeds. We, of course, if you know Jesus, you're filled with the spirit. We know light, we know joy, we know all of these things, but we are still susceptible to the darkness that stalks us in this world and that lives in each of our hearts. And saying, I could never do that, thinking, wow, that is crazy. I I could never do something like that. That is the first step towards doing something like this, okay? And so there has to be a recognition here that we are all capable of bad and evil deeds. I think the second thing that we can draw out from this story um, fairly objectively is a little thought experiment. What would have happened if David had looked away on that rooftop? What if he had just in that moment decided, nope, turned away and didn't end up in this cascading sort of compounding crazy scenario? So I think a principle there is we need to learn how to win the small battles against these things. Because if you win the small battles, you don't have to fight the much bigger ones that you're much more likely to lose. And obviously, if you're fortunate enough to have this kind of rooftop, don't linger up there. Um, Was that all right? That was good. You can choose the inputs that you allow in your life, pretty much, but you cannot control the outcomes. So David allowed himself to look at Bathsheba, but he couldn't control what happened after he did what he did, and she became pregnant. It all happened way outside of his control. You know, He could have not done it, but then he couldn't control Uriah's response of integrity that ultimately is what made Uriah be killed on a battlefield at David's um, doing. You know, So David... If he'd made a little bit of a different decision here, it would have had a very different impact on his life. Now, it's, no, it's, it's important to notice as well, um, in the rest of Second Kings, as it goes through David's life, he is forgiven. We're going to get to that in a moment. But his life is different after this point. He, he reaps the consequences of his decisions for the rest of his life after this point. And so if he had just won that small battle, things could have looked very, very different for him. So... We're all susceptible to these kind of things. I think we need to learn how to win the small battles. And the last, I think, kind of objective thing that we can say about the nature of sin, looking at this text, is that concealing sin compounds sin. So when something bad is done and it's tried to be covered up and hidden and and it's not just brought into the light, you have this exponential growth that happens. And so the glance at Bathsheba turns into an inquiry after her, at which point David probably thought it was still all perfectly innocent. But then he's into it, right? And then we have sex, murder, lies. It it kind of spirals. It grows very quickly from there. And so that seed of sin that I talked about a few moments ago that lies in each of our hearts, that seed can grow into a very big tree and ultimately into a forest if left unattended and if let um, thrive in the right kind of soil. And this kind of escalation that we see here of sinful actions is something that is throughout Scripture. Uh, If we think of Genesis 3 to 11, once the fall of man happens, it's kind of this crazy cascade of exponential, bad, terrible things that happens at that point. It also makes me think of the first Sam. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. And if you think about that, it's a little picture. You're walking, you're listening to someone, suddenly you get interested, you stand, you're in conversation, and then you sit. It's like this progressive journey that can happen. Whereas if you just keep walking at the first stage, you won't be sitting down or standing around it much longer. Sin can be this exponentially growing, compounding thing in your life. And so take a moment, like look at your life because all you need to see is a seed. And I would implore you to take action on that seed. Do you see a seed of self-pity or resentment or envy or jealousy? a seed of pride or of self-centeredness. Now imagine for a moment, based on this story of David, what might that seed become if it's allowed to flourish in your heart? Most of our self-image is based on the idea that we're better than other people. Like that's just part of what it is to be human. And for some people it's the inverse. They just think they're worse than everybody else. And that's also a problem. And so this stuff is in all of our hearts and our minds. And I'm willing to bet there's an area of your life where you've allowed a seed to grow a little bigger than you perhaps should have. 
We are all susceptible when the small battles concealing sin compound sin. This all sounds very neat. And I, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm kind of wary, to be honest, of creating like trite little sayings because I, just, I think sin is a very dangerous fire. And I think our hearts are incredibly deceitful. We're, we're very well versed at kind of not listening to the things we don't want to hear, um, aren't we? And so to, to kind of make it even more personal, I just want to say, you know, ask the Lord to reveal to you where these seeds might lie in your heart. Ask him to help you spot the signs of when you start walking down the wrong path. Something that I've become aware of recently in myself um, is that whenever I lose the kind of ongoing inner dialogue that I have with God over the course of any given day, whenever I lose that and it goes quiet, to me, that's a warning sign that I now try to act on very quickly. And so my best days, no matter what the circumstances, it might be a hard day full of lots of things or whatever, but my best days are those days where I've, I've, I've created that space in the morning, even if it's a couple of minutes, which it is in my household at the moment. Um, two minutes uninterrupted is a, truly a gift from God. Um, but those days where I start the day in a posture of prayer and openness to God, it doesn't need to be lofty and full of religious language. It's just that simple, God, be with me today. Speak to me. Let me listen to you. Let your words be my words. Let your thoughts be my thoughts. Let me not do anything that you would not be pleased. You know, just simple prayer, but putting myself into that posture of openness. And what I then find on a day like that is I'll be driving to the office after I drop Willow off at school or something. And the things that come into my mind, I will just naturally then be lifting to God. Do you know what I mean by that? There's like an inner dialogue that just happens throughout my day. And so for me, that's a good day, right? And if I have a day where I get halfway through and I realize that dialogue has gone quiet, and of course it's not constant, I'm busy in meetings, whatever it might be, but that's kind of the default that I go back to. And if I don't, if, if I lose that, I start to go, all right, I'm starting to walk down the wrong path here. I'm starting to stew on things that I shouldn't be stewing on. I'm starting to, you know, ruminate on things that will lead me to bad places. I need to cultivate and keep that inner dialogue going with my Father in heaven all day, every day. And so that's a warning sign in my life. It might be similar for you, but I would urge you try to find out and put your finger on it specifically. Like what's a warning sign that you might be walking down the wrong path? Staying close to God makes it much easier to stay away from bad thoughts, bad decisions, bad words. And we aren't given this level of detail in the text, but I would be willing to stake a lot that David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder, everything that, that happens here, it didn't come out of nowhere. And I think that that kind of hint at his inactivity in verse one is a little clue. I think this was possibly a season in David's life where he had allowed that dialogue with the Lord to go quiet. You know, maybe his usually fervent and robust and energetic prayer life is so clearly evidenced by the Psalms. Perhaps this was a season where he had let that slip. Perhaps being king, he was just used to being in charge. Things were going well. He was at the height of his success in Second Samuel chapter 10. Like that's the pinnacle of David's story. And it's interesting, isn't it? That that's the moment where this happens. And so, yeah, I, I, would, I would bet David was, was starting to give permission for sinful thoughts to linger in his mind long before he committed them with his body. And part of this, I think, um, especially for those of us who have been Christians a long time, it's learning how to, to keep our hearts soft to what matters to God. It's learning to be sensitive in the area of sin and, and then setting boundaries around that. I think of... Um, a man that I met probably, I think it was about 12 years ago. I used to be a musician, used to travel in bands. And then um, this one time we flew out to Florida to meet this man who was the sort of main Christian concert promoter for Florida. And is it like Alabama and Georgia, the sort of three states around there? Um, I used to live a very different life. Um, and so we flew out and this guy took us to Universal Studios for the day. You're like, that's awesome. I'm like, that's terrible. I hate roller coasters. This is ter I'd rather sit and read in the hotel. Um, but we did go to Bubba Gump's for lunch, so that was, that was, that was a nice part of the day. But anyway, so basically the, the, the point of the day was to, just to get to know. This guy wanted to get to know us as a band. We wanted to get to know him and then, you know, work together. And um, he was a wonderful man. Um, and uh, we were sort of asking him questions. We're standing outside. By the way, the f I never had gone on a roller coaster in my life at this point. And like I said, not really a thing for me. Um, and so the first roller coaster I ever went on was the Hulk in which some of you are laughing. It's the, I think it's, the, at least at the time, it was the fastest roller coaster in North America, probably therefore the world. 
I couldn't feel my arms for three days. Um, it, was, it was a horrible experience. But um, so anyway, we were getting to know this man and you know, asking, you know, so how did, how did you come to faith? And um, he, he started to well up and he recounted this story of when he was a teenager and he'd drank a little bit too much and he'd got in a car, I think his dad's car or something, and he'd gone for a drive and he'd like driven into a fence, right? It's a pretty innocuous story. Like there's a lot, and some of the guys, we were all Northern Irish. Let's just say if some of them hadn't met Jesus, they may have ended up in paramilitary organizations. So <laughs> this guy sort of drinking a little bit too much and driving into a fence, we were like, big deal. But I was really struck by how decades later, he, it still grieved him that he had done something like that. And of course, he was probably thinking of what could have happened if, if things had gone much worse. And I thought, God, I want to have a heart like that. You know, he was so sensitive to the things that might have grieved God that decades later, he was still shedding a tear over it. And I thought that was really beautiful. So be sensitive and, and set boundaries in place. Ready for part two? And so once we have recognized ourselves in David, once we've been realistic about the fact that we are all capable of such things, we are now ready for the surprising twist that comes next. Um, so I'm going to read now 2 Samuel chapter 12 this time, and we're going to look at verses 1 to just the start of verse 7. I'm having to be quite selective because both of these chapters we should read in full, and there, there's lots of other stuff in here, but of course we have to be um, sensitive to the time. So here we go. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man uh, this is a culture, remember, where hospitality to strangers is of paramount importance. But the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. It's really powerful. Imagine being in the room when Nathan looked King David of Israel in the eye and said, you are he. Notice who's doing the sending at the start of chapter 12 after David has done everything that he's done. God sends Nathan to David, <laughs> a little bit of a flip in the narrative now. But what we have here is not what you might expect given the severity of, of David's crimes as we have now discussed in gory detail. You would expect perhaps the Lord to send a prophet to just like outright condemn David, like name everything he's done and just chastise him and all of that. But what you instead get is, is a parable, like this little story that happens here. And if you've been around for the past couple of summers, we've looked at quite a few of Jesus' parables. And a parable is this short story that is designed to draw you in and tease you into active thought and to begin to notice things that you may not have noticed otherwise. And we have a case in point here. It's exactly what happens. David gets drawn in to this little short story that Nathan tells him. And his religious anger at the rich man begins to, to boil over. And um, one of the sort of bits of research I did on this talk, there's a whole sort of interesting thing of like psychoanalysis going on here of David's kind of suppressing his own guilt, but then projecting it. I'm not smart enough to tell you more about that. But if you're interested in that, you should go and look at it. It's really interesting. And, and David's response to, to what the rich man, you know, what should happen to him is extreme, even by the standards of Mosaic law that they were living under. As he listens to Nathan's story, his like zeal for justice is provoked. And the king um, in, in this instance, David, um, but the king in this culture 
was the safeguard of justice. He also functioned as a judge. People would have brought cases before him and he would have been expected to dispense justice. He should have been the safeguard of justice for his people. Who is this man, he says angrily. And right at this moment of meeting out judgment, Nathan utters the words. And I like to think Nathan did this kind of almost innocuously, quietly, just looked at David and he said, you are the man. And so very carefully, Nathan has led David into this place. He, 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 David now finds himself squarely in the crosshairs. But isn't it interesting that that line, you are the man, the indictment comes as the conclusion of Nathan's story, not as its opening, where we are so quick to want to run in and immediately cast blame and say what someone has done. That's not how the Lord has acted in this Instance, He doesn't denounce David in such a way that David is hardened and, and his defense barriers go up. And we know right, outright condemnation just does that. It puts defense barriers up and it shuts down dialogue. You can think, I'm sure, of a unfortunately famous um, a church somewhere in America that pickets funerals and does all kinds of stuff. It doesn't help anybody. It just puts people's backs up. Outright condemnation with no dialogue doesn't work. And the Lord knows this. And so what he does is he uses Nathan and he, he leads David into a place where he is convicted. And conviction, these are all words that are not popular in our culture, by the way. Conviction is different from condemnation. We have to be able to make that distinction. It's really important that you are able to understand that you can be convicted of something without being condemned. Tim Keller on this passage says, um, God always goes for conviction and conversion over condemnation. And then we cite John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God is in the business of convicting us where we have gone wrong, but he is not in the business of condemning us. And so there's a couple of uh, little things I want to just observe about this second part of the story. The firstly is Nathan plays like a vital function here. And, and how many of you know that often when you need to be corrected on something, it comes through other people that you trust, family, friends, children. Um, we had this amazing thing recently where... Um, Xander one night before bed had asked, you know, earlier on, do you want a bath? No, I don't want a bath today. And then of course, before bed, like when it's bedtime, he's like, I want a bath. And so Andrea's like, you can have a five minute bath. And she puts him in the bath for five minutes, gets him dry, gets him to bed. And then like two weeks later, something like that, the same thing happens, but it's Willow this time. And she says, no, I don't want a bath, gets to bedtime. And she says, mom, can I just have a five minute bath? And Andrea's like, no, you don't, you don't, we don't have a bath then. And she goes, but mom, you said to Xander, <laughs> like she, she did this anyway little fun story. Um, but often it's through others, right, that we realize the things that we are blind to, the inconsistencies in our own thinking, in our own lives. So I want to tell you, be a Nathan to those around you, and also make sure you find yourself some Nathans. And Nathan doesn't harangue, he doesn't be beat David over the head. He, he gently, and of course this is a parable, we have to you know, contextualize this, but, but the way that you live, you can help others to, to live a better way. By the way that you are a listener rather than someone who is always talking, always putting yourself in the driver's seat, you can be a Nathan for others. In Hebrews 3, 13, it says, exhort, or another word for, for that is confront one another daily, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Make sure you have relationships in your life where you can talk honestly and you can challenge other people where you think they may be going wrong and make sure that you are open to being challenged about where you may be going wrong. Side note, this doesn't happen electronically. Don't try to correct people on social media. It's a complete waste of everybody's time. It's a doom circle. Anyway, um, it's face to face. It's real physical presence that matters here. And, and last week, Adam talked about Jonathan and he encouraged us to you know, be a Jonathan and find Jonathans. And Jonathan was someone who brought strength and encouragement to David when he needed it most. But we also need to have Nathans who will challenge us when we need to be challenged. So that's the first thing I think is helpful to, to notice about this story. But secondly, and much more importantly, I think this exchange between Nathan and David and the way that it happens reveals something really important about the heart of God towards David and therefore the heart of God towards you and towards me. A little bit later on after this exchange has happened, David just 
admits it. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And the very next line out of Nathan's mouth, the Lord has taken away your sin. As soon as David confesses it, the Lord forgives him. We've realized by now that David's sin is great indeed. Really, really big. But the message here, I think, is, is really clear. God's grace and his forgiveness is so much greater than any of the wrong things that you have done or thought or said in your life. He drowns our sin in seas of crimson. And so the crosshairs that David found himself in, we find very quickly, are not the crosshairs of condemnation. They are the crosshairs of the gospel of grace. It's interesting, um, Psalm 51, which uh, is, of course, a very famous psalm of repentance. Um, it's, it's been held in, in, the, in church tradition that David composed Psalm 51 after this incident, and it's this admission of his failings and his crying out for the mercy of God. And in that psalm, there are uh, four different Hebrew words used for uh, David's failings. You know, we translate them as iniquity and sin and deeds, etc., but there are 19 words of God's action towards him, his mercy towards him, his cleansing, forgiveness towards him, his abundant love, his steadfast faithfulness. You know, all of the things that are God's action, there's 19 of words for that and only four for the entirety of David's sin. I think that's very telling. Eugene Peterson says, it's always a mistake to concentrate attention on our sins. It's God's work on our sins that is the main event. David's repentance is genuine, and that's important. There's, there's kind of a, a literary mirror thing that's happening here, because in 1 Samuel, in the story of, um, I'm going to forget now, this is where the tiredness is kicking in, Saul, of course, um, Saul uh, has this moment kind of of repentance, but it's not really genuine. It's in 1 Samuel 15. You can go and read it if you're interested. And it's sort of setting these two up as different models of how to confess and repent. And again, this is where I think David is a man after God's own heart, because though he has done much wrong here, he doesn't then continue to lie and to press in. He, he confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, he immediately submits to Yahweh's messenger in Nathan, and he comes with a contrite heart. And what we know of God throughout Scripture, and we sometimes do this weird thing where we think God is this angry dad in the Old Testament, and then it's all grace and fun and easiness in the New Testament, and that's just totally wrong. It's completely incorrect. One of the oldest creeds that we have is from Exodus 34. It's this divine self-revelation where God speaks to Moses, and in it, he says, I am a compassionate and a gracious God. I'm slow to anger. I abound in love and faithfulness. I maintain love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And we see this story played out in the Bible again and again and again. God wants to forgive people. He wants to restore us to life. He wants us to live in freedom and abundance from all of the things that uh, shackle us. It's always a mistake to concentrate on our sins and forget that the main event is God's action on our sins. I wonder if the band could join me up here. I think there's a number of ways we could respond to this. I'm aware this is a lot of ground to cover in um, 30 minutes or so. Feel free to close your eyes, open your hands as a posture of just openness to what the Spirit might want to speak to you in this moment. Lord, we thank you for this very powerful story that you have given us, and we pray that you would use it now to speak to our hearts. wonder if you were moved by the part where we sort of examined what, what happened in David's heart 
in this whole incident and you perhaps realize that there are seeds that you have allowed to grow a little bigger than you perhaps should have. And you maybe feel like you're in a place where you don't know how to win the small battles anymore. And I just wanna pray the grace of God in your life today. Perhaps you are watching someone that you care for make bad decisions at the moment and the call for you today is to be a Nathan to them, be a messenger of God to them, to draw alongside them, not in condemnation, but in love and in gentleness to lead them to a place where they confess, they repent and they ask for the freely given forgiveness of God. draw our minds to those people, Lord. Perhaps finally today, you struggle with the last part that we talked about. You struggle with the idea that God is truly for you, that he is not waiting on the sidelines to condemn you, but he is running towards you with open arms, willing that you would turn to him. He is the father of the prodigal son running out to meet his lost child. It's the same Jesus who says, come to me, all of you who are burdened, heavy laden, receive my rest. It may be something else entirely that's for you to discern in this moment. I'd love us to respond now. I think there's a couple of different ways we can, we can do that. I think it's okay if this is a bit of a messy one and we're doing sort of different things in the room. For some of you, you may wanna just pull up Psalm 51 in your Bible or on your phone, read through it, it's very powerful. Maybe read through it once and then pray through it slowly if you feel that that would be appropriate. Remembering that amazing promise in 1 John chapter 1 that if you confess your sins as you read through Psalm 51 he is faithful and just and will forgive you perhaps you would like some prayer and uh, we would love to do that um, I've heard I think we're a little thin on the ground with prayer team today but there's um, elders there's collective leaders there's people in the room that would love to pray for you so if you would like prayer just make yourself known to someone or do you come down to the front and for the rest of us um, you may want to stand and just sing together now in worship